A warm welcome to SNS, Sweden's leading independent research-based think tank. My name is Mia Huna Ransien, and I'm the CEO here at SNS. It is a great honor to host this webinar uh, on climate change mitigation in collaboration with the International Monetary Fund, IMF, and the Institute for International Economic Studies, IIES at Stockholm University. A substantial part of this year's recently published IMF World Economic Outlook is devoted to an analysis of different climate policy packages that have the potential to put the global economy back on a stronger as well as a more sustainable footing. As stated in the report, the window for attaining net zero emissions by 2050 and holding increases to safe levels is rapidly closing. So what are the climate mitigation tools available? And which mix of uh, measures is desirable? How can those most negatively affected by the measures proposed be compensated? These and other related issues will be discussed here today. So we are very happy to welcome Florence Schomot, who the lead author of chapter three in the IMF report. Florence will start to present the main findings. And uh, after that, we have invited John Hustler, professor at IAES to give a comment. Part of the analysis in the IMF report is based on a, recently, uh, on a recent research paper by John and his colleagues. The session will end with a panel discussion and Q&A where you're very much welcome to participate by writing questions in the Q&A um, function that you find at the bottom of your screen. So now, a warm welcome to Florence Schumacht. You are the Deputy Division Chief in the Multilateral Surveillance Division of the Research Department at IMF and the lead author of chapter three in the, this year's World Economic Outlook. Florence, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, uh, everybody, and thank you very much for this invitation. I will present today highlights from uh, the WIO chapter three on climate mitigation policies and invite you uh, all to have a look at the chapter itself and the annexes that contain much more material and which are available online. Uh, this, this chapter was prepared uh, by a large team of economists from the IMF Research Department, which are you know, listed in this first slide. Um, and I'm today here on behalf of the team uh, to, to present the main results. The window for limiting temperature increases to safe levels is closing rapidly. Uh, as you probably know, the increase in average temperatures uh, over the surface of the Earth uh, since the Industrial Revolution has been estimated at about one degree Celsius. Now, under unchanged policies, global temperature could increase by another two to five degrees Celsius by the end of this century, leading to temperatures not seen in millions of years. Such increases in temperatures uh, could lead to very large costs for the world economy and even possibly the risk of catastrophic outcomes. As you can see in the chart on the right hand side, estimates of damages from climate change vary, but the most recent estimates tend to point to very large um, uh, negative impacts on the world economy um, with global output in some scenarios being, um, you know, declining by up to 25%. Now, scientists have warned that temperature increases relative to pre-industrial levels should be kept uh, below 2 degrees Celsius and, if possible, at 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, to avoid reaching climate tipping points and imposing severe stress on social, economic, and natural systems. This objective was endorsed worldwide by policymakers at the 2015 
Paris Agreement. And what this, um, what this means really is that the world has to bring uh, net greenhouse emissions to about zero by mid-century. So this is a, a very a deep structural transformation. Now you could think that the current global recession makes it harder to act on climate uh, mitigation, but at the same time, this crisis could present a unique opportunity uh, to green the recovery. And this is for two reasons. On the one hand, the recovery stimulus can be designed um, to boost investment in green and resilient public infrastructure, laying the conditions for the transition to a low carbon economy. On the other hand, policies can ensure that the composition of the recovery in capital spending, in private capital spending, is consistent with decarbonization by providing correct price signals or other financial incentives. Now, against this background, the chapter attempts to answer two questions. First, how can we reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050 in a growth, employment, and distribution friendly way? And second, can well designed and sequenced mitigation policies help with the economic repair from the COVID 19 crisis? Before I delve uh, a bit more into the details of the analysis, let me um, give you an overview of the main takeaways. The first one is that reaching net zero emissions by 2050 is still feasible and would boost incomes in the long run and avoid catastrophic risk. The second one is that an initial green investment push combined with steadily rising carbon prices would deliver the needed emissions reductions at reasonable output effects. As a matter of fact, uh, there would be an initial boost to global output and employment, followed by only moderate output losses in the medium run. Third, we find that R&D subsidies for green technologies uh, can have payoffs, uh, strong payoffs in the medium run and are therefore an essential uh, complementary tool. Fourth, there are large cross-country differences in the output effects of the climate mitigation package, in particular, most oil producers and countries with fast economic or population growth are likely to bear larger costs in the medium run. However, these need to be weighted against avoided damages from climate change and what I, we call co-benefits, you know, which I will explain in more detail later. Last but not least, carbon revenue recycling can help compensate poor households and support job transitions to make sure this transition is fair and inclusive. Let me now um, um, present the main results of our analysis. In the first part of the chapter, we look at policies that have already been implemented and how they have worked out so far. Over the past uh, three decades, environmental policies have become more stringent. And this came with dramatic increases in innovation and investment in clean energy technologies, as you can see in the, in the left-hand side chart. Our econometric analysis suggests that the tightening of environmental policies explained about 30% of the increase in global clean energy innovation. And it explained also about 55% of the increase in the share of renewables in electricity generation. At the same time, there are concerns that climate policies will lead to job losses in carbon intensive activities, such as coal mining, shale, oil and gas production, carbon intensive manufacturing and transport. What we find in our analysis is that policies have broadly succeeded in reallocating jobs from high to low carbon sectors. And therefore that the net effect on aggregate jobs is typically small. 
However, this job transition uh, can still involve costs for the workers affected, and therefore it will be important, uh, as I will discuss later, to make sure uh, that uh, these job transition are supported. As you can see on the right hand side, um, this is an illustration of our results, uh, which looks at firm level data from the World Scope database and where we've looked at the impact of um, environmental policy stringency on employment in different sectors, as well as on employment of firms with different uh, intensity of emissions. Broadly speaking, uh, these policies led to decline in employment in high emission industries and gains in low emission uh, sectors, such as, for example, services. If you look at the, on the right hand side at the split between high emission and low emission firms, you can see that environmental policy stringency tended to depress employment in high emission firms, but increase it in low emission firms. In the second part of the chapter, we examine mitigation policies that are needed to bring uh, us to net carbon emissions by mid-century. Broadly speaking, governments have two types of instruments that they can use to reduce emissions. Uh, these are, on the one hand, carbon pricing, and on the other hand, green supply policies. By carbon pricing, we mean raising the price of carbon, and this can be done either by a carbon tax or by a carbon emission trading scheme. Regulations are also a way to implicitly raise uh, the price of carbon. The second set of policies, which we call green supply policies, aim at making low carbon energy sources more abundant and cheaper. And they include measures such as subsidies and price guarantees in low carbon energy sector, direct public investment in low carbon infrastructure and technologies, and uh, research and development subsidies. Now, our um, argument is that when combined, green supply policies and carbon pricing uh, can actually deliver quick and substantial reductions in emissions without causing a large declines in output or consumption during the transition. And this is you know, what we aim to illustrate here. Now, the chapter takes as given the objective of reaching net zero emissions by mid-century, um, but uh, tries to pay um, uh, attention to the political economy of this uh, by trying to make uh, this transition as growth friendly as possible and also by um, trying to make it as inclusive as possible uh, by featuring some redistributive measures for households that are affected by the increase in carbon prices. Now, more specifically, this package, we look at this comprehensive macro package, which is a combination of four elements. The first one is these green supply policies, and there is a subsidy on renewables production, as well as, well as a 10-year green public investment program. Second element is the carbon tax, or you know, this could be implemented in other ways, but for the modeling, we're using a carbon tax. And um, we, we, we introduce it gradually. So we start from very low levels and then it, it rises relatively fast, uh, reaching between $40 and $150 per ton of CO2 in 2050. The third element is compensatory transfers to households, as I will discuss later, about, uh, we use about a quarter of carbon tax revenues to protect the purchasing power of poor households. Finally, we assume supportive macro policies. So at the beginning of the package, the revenues from the carbon tax are not enough to cover the spending of, of the macro package. Therefore, we assume that there is some fiscal easing uh, financed by debt. Uh, for the first decade. However, this is occurring in an environment of low for long interest rates. In terms of instruments, uh, models that we use to um, analyze the effects of this package, we used a global macro model, uh, which is the G-cubed model from uh, Warwick McCabe. 
uh, which is very, very well suited for this type of analysis as the model uh, features detailed energy sectors, but at the same time is a macro model uh, with a number of features such as forward looking agents, uh, real and nominal rigidities and fiscal and monetary policies, which allows us to look at the macroeconomic dynamics um, in the short, medium and long term. We combine this global macro model with the uh, integrated assessment model by Professor Hassler, um, Krusel and Olofsson. Uh, to derive the dynamics of temperature, estimates of damages from climate change. Uh, this model also has a very strong advantage is that it can uh, allow us to look at the, the possibility of endogenous technological change, that is technology reacting uh, uh, endogenously, spontaneously to the policies that are put into place. Now, the main simulation I'm going to present do not have this channel of endogenous technological change, but I will discuss afterwards um, how this can make a difference. Now, let me turn to the results uh, from these simulations, which are really illustrative. So the goal was to show what the main mechanisms at work are and provide some order of quantification but the exact mag magnitudes are, of course, subject to uncertainty. Now, the bottom line from the simulation is that the policy package boosts output and employment in the initial years, supporting the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis, and thereafter the costs of the transition are moderate. Both the green uh, fiscal stimulus and carbon pricing play key roles here. So let's first look at the left-hand side, which shows the evolution of uh, uh, emissions. Um, the red line shows you the baseline uh, emissions. The green line will be the effect of the green uh, fiscal stimulus, broadly speaking, and the blue line at the bottom is the combined effect of the green fiscal stimulus and the carbon tax. So as you can see in this chart, the green fiscal stimulus reduces emissions but its effectiveness is much lower than that of the carbon tax. That is because the carbon tax, in addition to increasing the price of high uh, carbon energy relative to low carbon energy, also increases the overall energy price and therefore incentivizes energy efficiency. So you have two margins uh, through which it uh, reduces emission. Thus carbon pricing in whatever form it's implemented is a key element to reach net zero carbon emissions. Without it, we wouldn't get the, the fast and substantial emissions reductions that are needed to be able to reach net zero emission by mid-century. On the right hand side, we show the impact of the policy package and the different layers of this policy package on real GDP in deviation from baseline. Initially, it's increasing aggregate demand. So it's, you know, the typical effect of a fiscal stimulus. But over time, economy and incentivizing more private investment in those sectors. So there is a more lasting effect. Over the first 15 years, the effect of the green stimulus are large enough to comfortably offset the economic costs of the carbon tax and therefore support the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. After 15 years, as carbon prices are being raised, the drag from the carbon tax becomes larger and results in small net output losses, which are shown in the red diamonds, and which reach about 1% of baseline GDP by 2050. Now, this is very manageable when one considers that the world economy is expected to grow by about 120% between now and 2050. So this is 1% from baseline GDP, again, against a growth of 120% of global GDP. Now, if we take into account what we call co-benefits from climate mitigation policies, and this is the fact that climate mitigation policies will also reduce air pollution, uh, for example, and therefore reduce uh, pre uh, premature mortality and improve health outcomes. Uh, the impact of the package could actually be neutral for global output by 2050. Now, the 
effects of the mitigation package on employment follow broadly those on output. So initially, global uh, employment would be higher by about 12 million people on average each year for the first seven years. That would be followed by a small decline in employment relative to uh, employment growth in the baseline. And by mid-century, employment would be above uh, baseline level. The expanding uh, low carbon sectors are actually relatively labor intensive compared to high carbon sectors. So these low carbon sectors are renewable energy, retrofitting uh, of buildings, electric car production, um, and the services sectors. These are the low carbon sectors which are expanding during the low carbon transition and uh, are a, a strong creator of jobs. As you can see on the right hand side, we show job multipliers for different uh, sources of energy uh, to illustrate their uh, job potential. However, overall, the policy package um, entails a substantial reallocation of employment, as you can see in the left-hand side chart of about 2% of employment from these high to low carbon sectors. And this can cause difficult transition for, uh, for workers that will need to be supported. Now, while the, the transitional costs are small for, uh, at the global level, there, are, there can be large differences between uh, the experience of uh, different countries. Countries that, have, that are expected to, uh, to experience fast economic or population growth and most oil producers would bear larger costs during the, the transition. But these have to be weighted against you know, what they can get from this, which is first these co-benefits, co which I mentioned before, and second, the avoided damages from climate change. So if we look in the chart on the left-hand side, you can see that costs are larger, uh, of course, for OPEC and Russia, which are you know, uh, fossil fuel producers. They're also larger for India, which is expected to uh, experience both high economic and population growth, and for the uh, rest of the world. Now, these countries are expected to uh, enjoy substantial co-benefits from these mitigation policies, especially in terms of reduced pollution and therefore much better health outcomes. These benefits can be quite substantial, as you can see, in, for example, in the green bars in the chart for China, also for India, for the rest of the world, and for Russia. The second thing is that these countries will uh, uh, strongly benefit from avoided climate change. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is that many of these countries are already hot countries. And the evidence has shown that uh, these countries are the ones that are expected to be uh, more affected, at least initially, by the change in the climate. <clears throat> so, we illustrate this on the right hand side by showing you that over time, the world economy benefits from avoiding damages from climate change, meaning that output would be much higher uh, under climate change mitigation than it would have been under the baseline, so under unchanged policies. There's a lot of uncertainty about these estimates because these are temperatures we have not experienced in millions of years. But the more recent studies, such as, for example, the one uh, by Berg, Siang, and Miguel, uh, show much larger estimates uh, um, of damages than earlier studies. They show, for example, that by the end of the century, if we do mitigate climate change, uh, global output could be about up to 13% higher than it would have been under unchanged uh, policies. And we tend to believe that these are likely to understate the benefit from climate mitigation because these estimates uh, typically do not capture fully the damages that would arise from climate change. Um, it, they capture imperfectly, for example, increased frequency and severity of natural disasters, uh, the, the effects of rising sea levels, or for example, in the case of Russia, the melting, the effects of the melting of the permafrost, and of course, you know, they cannot take um, fully into account the risk of catastrophic outcomes. 
Let me now turn to uh, uh, the role of technological progress. Uh, this is an analysis that we did uh, based on the model of Professor Hassler and his co-authors. And um, <clears throat> we used their model uh, and we um, tried to build on it uh, to look at the role of endogenous technological change in response to the policies being implemented. Now the development of technologies is a key enabler of the transition to a low carbon economy and can potentially reduce transitional costs by making uh, alternative technologies available at a lower cost. What we find in the model is that when we take into account the fact that technology reacts to the policy, uh, policies that are put in place like carbon taxes or R&D subsidies, the same reduction in emissions can be achieved by um, an increase in carbon tax that's about half the original increase in the carbon tax. And that helps reduce uh, significantly the transitional costs of mitigation policies. This is what we illustrate on the right hand side. There is a strong case to complement carbon pricing with R&D subsidies early on. A number of ar arguments have been made in the literature uh, there are a number of market failures uh, that can be uh, that can um, um, provide a justification for increasing R and D subsidies. These include knowledge spillovers, which means that when an, an innovator um, uh, comes up with an innovation, this actually makes it easier for the next innovator to you know to develop new knowledge. Uh, but this you know, these benefits are not taken into account by the, the original innovator, so he may tend to do too little innovation compared to what he should do uh, if he were to take uh, into account these spillovers into it. The second one is path dependency of research, so incumbent technologies do have an advantage, and that can create entry barriers for new technologies um, through economies of scale, sunk costs, uh, or network effects. The third argument is the difficulty in accessing finance for high uh, risk and high uncertainty projects, such as the development of radically new technologies, which is highly uncertain. And that a good example of the role of technology uh, is the electricity sector, where low carbon uh, technologies already exist and are economically competitive. So they are likely to make the transition uh, of this sector are uh, much uh, smoother and less costly. In the last part of the chapter, we examine the distributional effects of, um, of uh, carbon prices and how to mitigate these effects to ensure a fair transition. Carbon mitigation policies will have differentiated impacts uh, on households of different income levels or employed in different sectors. And this is for two main reasons. Um, that low-income households are more likely to be impacted. The first one is that in many, but not all countries, low-income households tend to spend a larger share of their income on energy-intensive goods. The second reason is that they tend to be employed in low-skill low occupations in carbon-intensive sectors. When we look at opinion polls, uh, as shown on the right-hand side, the level of support uh, for protecting the environment over uh, economic growth is uh, the lowest uh, for uh, lower skilled workers in um, high carbon sectors, as you can see on the right-hand side. Now, governments can use various policies to try to limit the adverse effects of higher carbon prices on uh, households. The first one is to rebate part of the carbon uh, price revenues uh, through uh, transfers to households, either universal or targeted uh, cash transfers. As you can see in the left-hand side chart, we're simulating the effect of a $50 carbon tax under different recycling options for revenues and we look at the impact on the consumption of the bottom two quintiles of households so the the 40 percent poorest household what you can see is when we use universal transfers or uh, targeted cash transfers uh, the consumption of these 
households is actually uh, unaffected or actually higher than if there were no carbon tax. So there is a lot of potential to use these revenues to offset uh, these effects. We calculate that actually, if we just wanted to protect the purchasing power of these households, it would be enough to use a sixth to a quarter of the carbon revenues in targeted cash transfers. And this is based on uh, calibration for the US and China. If we wanted to protect the 40, so that's sorry, that was to protect 20% of households. If we wanted to protect 40% of households, then we should use between 40 and 55% of carbon tax revenues um, to in targeted uh, cash transfers. Now, a second type of policy that can be used is to uh, increase government spending in low carbon sectors. And there we're coming back to this idea of a green fiscal stimulus, and that is to support job transition. So while increasing government spending on low uh, carbon goods and services would you know, fail to protect the, the uh, consumption of poorer households, so the, the, the reduction in their purchasing power per se from higher carbon prices, it would prevent a decline in aggregate employment and spur a further reallocation of workers uh, from high to low carbon sector. So that's from the employment side. In practice, governments will face pressure to do both, that is to support the job transitions, but also to protect the purchasing power of poorer households. And they can use a combination of measures uh, to address these two effects. We're coming now to the conclusions and um, I, I wanna summarize briefly the main takeaways from the analysis. The first one is that net zero emissions by 2050 is still a feasible objective that would boost incomes in the long run and avoid catastrophic risk. But the window is rapidly closing. We find that an initial green investment push combined with steadily rising carbon prices would deliver the needed emissions reductions at reasonable transitional output effects. Now, the green fiscal stimulus is really important to support output and employment in the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis, and also to help lower the costs of adjusting to higher carbon prices by increasing productivity and laying the conditions uh, uh, for private investment uh, to, um, to, to lead to this low carbon transition. Second, carbon pricing is critical to mitigation because higher carbon prices discriminate better between different energy sources and incentivize energy efficiency, in addition to reallocating resources from high to low carbon activities. Finally, a fair transition requires compensating lower income households for higher carbon prices and supporting job transitions to low carbon sectors. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Florence, for a very interesting and, and very important and clear presentation. Um, just to remind uh, the audience that you're more than welcome to put questions um, on, on the uh, Q&A function uh, that we will bring up in the uh, ending part of the uh, session. Because now I would like to invite John Hustler to give a comment. You are professor at the Institute for International Economic Studies at Stockholm University, and you are also the lead author of the SNS Economic Policy Council 2020 report, Swedish Policy for Global Climate, and which we just made available on last Friday in English on our website. You have the floor, John, please. Thank you very much, Mia, and thank you very much, Florence, for, for a very interesting uh, presentation. I, I have to say I'm pretty impressed. We, we talked about this chapter in, in August, and, and since then you have produced so many interesting and, and convincing arguments, so, so my compliments. So, so let me start with uh, a picture that I suppose you have all seen, at least variants of it, and that, that starts with a with the idea that uh, the climate crisis is, is an acute threat to the survival of, of mankind. Uh, and 
In addition, uh, we often hear that solutions to this are extremely costly and, and involve uh, things like a complete change of lifestyle, uh, degrowth, uh, unseen structural change, uh, new economic systems, uh, removing democracy, and, and a lot of other things, uh, perhaps also involving uh, that we shouldn't have any uh, children in the future. Uh, <clears throat> So this suggests that the climate change uh, is a wicked problem uh, there where kind of we are damned whatever we do. So we are in, in dire straits. Uh, in contrast to that, there is another narrative. Um, and that, that starts with noting that uh, there is no doubt that climate change is for real, but that the global uh, aggregate consequences for welfare are probably not very large. Uh, IPCC reports uh, uh, that the GDP losses from two degrees warming are probably in the range 0 0.2 to 2% of GDP. But they also stress that there is a very large uncertainty and uh, even though there is little evidence for large global tipping points, these cannot be ruled out and things can be much, much worse than what we think they uh, will be. So there's an enormous amount of uncertainty uh, regarding the consequences of, of emitting CO2. Uh, this report is largely or actually totally about the other claim that solutions are, are very costly and uh, the report really shows that they are not. Uh, a clever climate policy need not have large effects on, on either growth or, uh, or, or other uh, parts that are, we think are important for our welfare. And they, they surely do not, uh, uh, they show that the, the solution does not require a new economic system, um, apart from maybe in, in China, but I don't think they mentioned that. Uh, so the key results, if I'm going to summarize them again, is that uh, uh, global carbon neutrality by 2050 can be done uh, by facing in a fairly modest carbon price. Uh, uh, Florence uh, gave us the numbers for, for 2050, but for 2030, uh, they are uh, planned to be in the order of 10 to $40 per ton of CO2. <clears throat> So the upper range there is, is in the same order that's at, that the price we now have on the emission uh, system, uh, emission trading system, EU ETS. And, and uh, for those of you who are not used to these kinds of numbers, uh, that would correspond to 2.5 to 10 cents per liter of gasoline. So not the particularly large uh, carbon tax is, is, is needed. Uh, but the key is, of course, that it's, it's uh, implemented broadly, also covering coal, which is very price sensitive. Uh, the introduction of such a, uh, uh, such a, a, a price on emissions has non-negligible uh, negative effects on growth and also on the income distribution. But these effects can, can largely be neutralized by a debt financed infrastructure investment project, uh, program and a green energy subsidies. Uh, and that should start uh, in the order of 1% of, of GDP. And so for Sweden, 50 billion crowns per year, but it will be phased out over 10 years. So not a dramatically large program. And you also need transfers to low income households, but they can be financed uh, by by uh, a lesser share of the revenues from the carbon pricing revenues. So, so as you saw uh, Florence noting that, that if you wanna compensate the poor 20%, you need maybe a sixth or so of the revenues from the carbon pricing uh, uh, system. So these are not particularly large programs. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, report also note that uh, we uh, uh, will see uh, a need for for a labor reallocation, 2% uh, of the labor force, but these are not large uh, figures either. 2% of the labor force, that's about the, the, the number of, of gross jobs that are created in a month in, in the US. And, and 
uh, you mentioned also specifically people working in coal mines and, and fracking and the oil and gas industry. And in the US, that's around 200,000 people that needs to be reallocated. Of course, other people too, but those uh, were particularly emphasized. 200,000 people, uh, that's about the number of, of, of employees in the US that had to change jobs when McDonald's introduced uh, automatic teller machines. So this is not a particularly large uh, uh, issue either for these people, of course, but not in the aggregate. <clears throat> Some of the countries will face a little bit higher costs, and, and you noticed India, but you also noticed that India is, supposed, is, is, is expected to have a quite large uh, growth rate over this, uh, uh, the, the coming 30 years. Uh, so with the policy, uh, India is expected to grow by 277%, uh, and without the policy, 287 and then taking into account COVID benefits and so this is not very uh, problematic. Uh, but all parts of the world must participate. That's key, otherwise it's not going to work. Uh, so you talked about the policy mix uh, uh, and, and, and uh, a key result in the report is that carbon pricing is necessary for CO2 reduction. Uh, R&D subsidies and green infrastructure investment that you also suge suggest cannot substitute for, for, the, for the effect of pricing. And, and you show that actually emissions will increase if you only do R&D subsidies and green infrastructure investments. Um, and this result is, is, is very much in line, both quantitatively and qualitatively, with, with the, the research that I've done with, with Pat and Condi. Uh, uh, as I said, you also emphasize that we should have uh, some short-run stimulus, uh, and uh, we should have R&D subsidies and green infrastructure in investments. Uh, we don't find that in our work, and, 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 and why is that? Well, I think one of the key reasons is that your model is, is substantially, uh, the cube model is substantially more uh, complicated and has a lot more short-run frictions, real, financial, and nominal. So there is uh, rigidity in the prices. Uh, some people have no access to, uh, to, um, to uh, uh, financial markets and just consume their incomes and so on. And that changes uh, substantially the dynamics within, say, a decade. Uh, and, and they also provide a role for these additional policies. So I, I think it's, it's not surprising that you find a role for them while, while we don't. <clears throat> uh, uh, let me now come to the, the climate damages. I think the report is, is not about that, but, but you use uh, uh, that to, to some of, of, of your results. And, and I, there, I think we have to uh, understand that it's extremely difficult to assess the economic consequences of climate change and, uh, and the, the consequences of welfare. And, and I think that uh, the, some, some studies use statistical relations between weather and GDP, and I don't think these are reliable. Uh, we, we need more of a macroeconomic model to put some disciplines on these statistical results. And, and actually, I think that the, 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 the paper that you based some of the results on, Burke et al., uh, in this report, is actually a bad, bad example of, of how uh, uh, one shouldn't do and, and how little evidence there is in, in the statistical uh, regressions. But this is not at all essential for your results, but I, I want to point it uh, uh, to it anyway. So what Burke et al. do is that they, they regress yearly GDP growth uh, in uh, different countries and different regions on uh, the temperature in, in that region and on the square temperature in order to find a relation between growth and regional temperature. And then if the regional temperature changes, as, as all temperatures are going to do if we have climate change, they can kind of see how much that is going to affect growth. And then they extrapolate these short-run uh, changes until 2100. And what they find is that growth tends to increase in the temperature in the region if it is lower than 12.7 degrees and it's, it decreases if, if the initial temperature is higher than that. Uh, so 
uh, and then the aggregate over the whole world. Uh, and, and since kind of a substantial amount of GDP is produced in, in regions where the average yearly temperature is higher than 12.7 degrees, you get uh, a substantial global aggregate negative effect on growth. Uh, and this is, as you noticed, larger than in some of uh, previous studies. So, so this is, uh, I did, I, I took their estimates and just looked at the consequences for, for European countries uh, in a scenario where GDP, uh, sorry, where, where the global mean temperature increases by two and a half degrees. Uh, and this, this is going to have slightly larger effects up here, as, as we all know. So this is what happens to France. They, over the coming uh, 80 years, uh, are going to have see an increase in growth uh, of nine percent in in the at the end due to this uh, climate change, uh, but Italy is going to see a loss of six percent, and that's because France is is colder than twelve point seven degrees, and Italy is 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 uh, hotter than six uh, than than twelve point seven degrees. This is how it looks for the rest of the, of, of the EU 15 countries. Finland is going to gain 625% by, by climate change, uh, Sweden by 517, and Portugal is going to lose 32% uh, from, from climate change. And certainly these results are completely at odds with how we think that our economies are working, and, and I don't think they should be trusted. Uh, so the conclusion here is that we, we really... Uh, don't know uh, how much uh, climate change we're going to get for some uh, uh, emissions, and we don't know how much damage is that is going to cause. But at least we know that uh, it's not going to be costly to 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 try to deal with climate change. Um, so I think this is a very interesting and well executed study, and 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 the, and, and the key takeaway, which I think is the, the important thing, is that the solution to the climate problem does not have to be very difficult or costly, uh, and and. Uh, and these policies are a very cheap insurance against these very uncertain consequences of emissions of CO2, and they should be implemented. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's not difficult, I think, to draw the policy conclusions here, despite the fact that we are so uncertain about uh, the consequences of, of, of emissions of CO2. Uh, so I think that this report should have made, made it to the front page uh, with having headlines uh, everywhere. And it should also have featured in, in Greta's special edition of Dagens Nyheter, which unfortunately it, it didn't. So I'm going to end with just asking why are these kinds of, of results that I think gives us you know, a great deal of hope and show that it doesn't have to be difficult to deal with these issues. Why don't they make the head, head, uh, front line uh, headlines? Thank you. Thank you, John, for, for those comments. And before I open the floor uh, and bring in questions, I just want to give uh, also floor, invite Florence back in the, in the picture and uh, uh, ask you if you have any quick comments to what you just heard from John. Thank you very much, John, for this, uh, this very uh, nice discussion and, you know, the, the excellent points you made. Um, I just want to say a few words about the, you know, the estimates from, um, of damages from climate change. Um, I mean, we fully agree with you that there is really a, a, a lack of, uh, of good estimates, good and comprehensive estimates out there. And the key difficulty is that the, the you know, the, the range of temperatures we have observed or variation within countries, you know, is, is very small and we have not experienced, you know, what we might be experiencing in, in, in the next few decades or by 2100. So what studies typically do is they look at these, you know, within country temperature variation, you know, over the last 50 years or maybe a bit longer, and they try to extrapolate what would happen if temperature increases by three or five degrees Celsius. As I said, so far, we have experienced a one degree Celsius warming. So th there is definitely a limitations to, you know, how, how we can predict these damages. Um, because there is so much uncertainty, we wanted to provide a range of estimates. I think the, you know, Professor Nordhaus estimates, which are on the smaller side, have also been criticized for being too optimistic, you know, about the, you know, 
what could be the damages from climate change. So we took a bit too extremes in a way, you know, from what's, what's available out there just to provide a, a range uh, of, of uh, what the damages could be. I would say that uh, what's common uh, in, in the, this literature is this idea of a nonlinear relationship between temperature and damages. So the idea that uh, cooler regions may benefit, in, at least initially, from global warming because you know they may be able to cultivate larger areas of the, of the country, while um, sorry, uh, hotter regions will be damaged, you know, uh, more. One, one main difference in in this Burke, Siang, uh, and other study is that they they allow for growth effects, so more permanent effects, you know. On, 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 on growth than, than other study and therefore because it accumulates over time it generates it generates larger estimates of damage. Um, so what I would say is it's very hard to extrapolate the, the damages we can uh, expect but I, I think the, the main takeaway from this is that we should err on the side of caution and I think that's also a message from uh, one of your papers that uh, you know the cost of doing too little is, is way way larger than the cost of doing too much, you know, to mitigate climate change. And we fully agree, you know, with, with this conclusion. Thank, thank you, Florence. We do have questions coming in from the audience. We, I, I would like to start with one question, which is a kind of an overarching question. Estimates of the short-term costs of mitigation are modest compared to the far greater long-term cost of mitigation failure. This is something I think you both alluded to. The argument for action is overwhelming, even more so if one adds uncertainty and irreversibility. Why is not enough action taken? That's, could I add also another question that comes from Damien Mikkel from the, it's a Swedish tax authority. Uh, how complex is the coordination problem of a global carbon tax? Um, you both underlined the extreme importance of getting um, uh, getting a, a carbon tax in place uh, and it's not even on the negotiating table yet so these two big questions Florence yes why no action is uh, you know is, is an excellent question but also very difficult to answer uh, there are a lot of political economy uh, there are a lot of political political economy constraints that governments face. I tried to discuss some of these uh, when I talked about, you know, households uh, being more, especially low-income households being more affected, uh, both from the, the consumption side and the employment side. And there are also, you know, of course, constraints from, uh, from firms, right, who, who see that their production cost may, might increase, they may need to adjust, you know, the technologies they're using, and um, we, we, I mean, that's one area we want to look more into is how, you know, how can we address these, these concerns uh, and uh, to, to help government design their policy, uh, their policies um, in a way that's less costly politically. And, you know, that will therefore uh, help them um, uh, make more progress on this. Uh, it's, it's also, you know, climate, climate mitigation and climate change, it's what we call a global public good, you know, which means there are big free riders, potential free riders problems, um, and uh, that creates, that makes it very difficult for uh, governments to coordinate. Um, that brings me to the second question that was raised. Um, the, in addition to this, you know, risk of free riding and, you know, are, you know yeah. suppose that I'm taking <laughs> action to mitigating climate change, but, you know, this other government is not so in the end climate change will happen anyway. So, you know, I may have incurred some costs, but for not much benefit in the end, you know, if others don't do their share. So that, that's this idea of the, the free rider problem. In terms of uh, coordination around uh, 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 global carbon tax, um, I would say I would say give two points. The first one is that the one of the difficulty is that uh, countries are diff taking different approaches towards mitigation, and uh, carbon taxes have not been very uh, popular. Um, 
For example, in the US, you know, the US is very focused on green spending and on regulations, so a regulatory approach. Uh, EU is focused on emission trading scheme. China is looking, I mean, as some pilot emission trading scheme is looking at emission trading schemes. So different countries have different approaches and, you know, how would you, you know, uh, uh, put all these uh, different measures, you know, in a common metric. So, you know, if a country says, I want to do regulations, I, I don't want to have a carbon tax, then you would have, you know, to find a framework also to, you know, to, to, uh, to, to be able to bring together, you know, these different initiatives and, and make them more comparable. The second thing is, although, uh, you know, we, we, we would be, uh, we, we fully support the idea of having a, a, a global carbon tax. I think that would be the most efficient, effective way of doing it. And it has been, you know, the literature has shown this for, for decades. Uh, we cannot wait for that to happen to take action. And that's a bit, you know, the perspective we took in the chapter. We basically have each country focusing on themselves. And how can you reduce your emissions to net zero? You know, uh, you know, and how is that in your in your best interest? Uh, in the chapter, we we focus a lot on these local co-benefits because these are uh, benefits that come to the country locally, so they benefit from it and they can come immediately. So the benefits are not so delayed, you know, in time. We think that for some of the large emerging countries, this is really an important. Uh, argument to take action now. Uh, they can have tangible benefits, which you know they can sell uh, to their, that can uh, benefit their population in the short term. Um, the other one is, you know, this uh, of course for countries like India. India would be one of the most affected countries by climate change because it's already a very hot country. And uh, although it's, you know, the political economy is very difficult in India because the population is still relatively low income and they're, you know, very concerned about uh, eradicating poverty and this transition, you know, may look daunting um, when, when you have these such urgent problems. Uh, we think it's really key for, you know, for, for this country that uh, action is taken on, on, on mitigation. I want to thank you really for, for those answers. And also, I'm very sorry that we are running out of time. And uh, I think we have touched upon terribly important issues, which relates also to political economy, but also many other aspects of what you have presented to, our, uh, to us here today. So I really want to thank you and John for giving us these important contributions to this important discussion. And uh, also thank you for the, in the audience for your questions. And we are we will see how we can deal with the questions which have come in and we, uh, maybe we sure. can transfer them to you, Florence and yes. John, for mm -hmm. answers. That would be fantastic. But also at SNS, we will obviously in, uh, come back to these very important issues of climate change in our webinars, in our research projects, and also in publications. And uh, just to say that the next upcoming seminar is on December 14. Uh, when a new SNS report on green nudges as an environmental policy instrument will be presented and discussed. And also, I want to uh, say that on our webpage, you'll find a number of recent events and publications of different aspects of climate change and mitigation and other issues related to climate change. So please visit it, us there. And also, I do hope that you come back to, to us uh, soon. And um, uh, thank you very much for your cooperation today. And, um, and, and participation today, and also hope to see you soon again. So goodbye and thank you.